going to be leading us tonight, and we're going to be in Titus chapter 2. Um, now, Titus, the Apostle Paul, uh, between his imprisonments, wrote this epistle uh, to a young pastor named Titus, which the, he was the pastor of the church in Crete. And now, you know, Titus was Paul's protege, uh, T- or Titus was basically uh, being mentored by Paul. But Titus had a large challenge in Crete, which if you know anything about geography, uh, you may remember that Crete is an island of Greece. And at this point in time, it had unprecedented moral corruption. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? (laughs) Very similar to what we have today here in America and what we're dealing with. But Paul encouraged Titus to focus on sound doctrine, godliness, grace, and good works. But before we actually get to the text tonight, I want to share with you a quick story of the wisdom that the Lord spoke to me through a cactus. Now, I know that may sound weird to you, but it's kind of a funny story. About, oh, 12 years ago, my wife and I were moving back from Wisconsin after being missionaries up there for a short term. And when we were moving back, some of our friends, they they gave us a parting gift, and it was a cactus. And I thought, well, this is going to be fun. You know, I never had a cactus before. I'm not a green thumb. So I was thinking, hey, this is going to be perfect for me. There's no way I'm going to kill a cactus, right? They're in the desert. It's going to be easy to take care of. So we got back and I started, you know, uh, taking care of this cactus and thinking through, all right, it's going to be easy. It needs water, sunlight, maybe you need to watch the temperature of it, so on and so forth. Uh, Yeah, I killed that cactus with flying colors. It didn't last but a few months. I killed it. And I was like, all right, no big deal. Well, years later, I shared the same message um, about the cactus with, with, a, with a church group, and one of the church members decided to be a smart aleck. You know, none of y'all are smart alecks, are you? Nobody? Yeah, maybe a little bit. <laughs> but one of them started, decided to be a smart aleck, and so they brought me another cactus to try it again. They're like, now, now, Pastor, we, we know that you, you learned your lesson and that you are more familiar with t- tending to a cactus, so here's another one. I'm sure you can keep this one alive. Well, this time I was, you know, extra careful on what not to do. The first time, uh, my office was in a, had no windows, and I left it there, so it wasn't getting enough sunlight, so I knew, okay, don't leave it in a dark office. And I was so, I was focused on the don'ts. Well, guess what? I killed that cactus too. So I was two cacti in and they were both gone. But all that to say is that although I was avoiding doing the wrong things with it, I had failed to do some of the right things. Researching how much water the cactus really needed how much sunlight it needed, what temperature it needed to stay at, when I needed to repot it, so on and so forth. There were so many little things I needed to really focus in on that were good, but I was so focused on the what not to do, I forgot to do what I needed to do. And in his letter to Titus, Paul writes a little bit on those lines. And I want us to take a look at it tonight. So if you will turn with me to Titus chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 11 through 14. And it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for God's work. So church, the first thing I want to highlight tonight in this passage is simply this, is that no matter what we're focused on in our lives, no matter what the world's trying to tell us, there is only one standard that we need to compare ourselves to, and that is Jesus. Jesus is our plumb line. You know, many times we look and look at ourselves and say, hey, well, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm doing very good in my walk with Christ because I'm not like that person, or I'm not living like they are. 
And so it kind of pats ourselves on the back and we think we're doing really well. But we need to remember that our focus shouldn't be on others living around us. It should be on Jesus Christ because he is our plumb line. In the book of Amos, the Lord gave a plumb line. In Amos 7, 8, it says, The Lord said to me, What do you see, Amos? And I said, A plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. See, as Christians, we often measure spiritual growth by how successful we are at avoiding sin. Our testimonies proclaim how life with Christ has helped us eliminate sin from drug use, from immorality, from cursing, from anger issues, from gossip. But so oftentimes it ends there. However, my failure with the cactus serves as an example that it takes more than avoiding sin to grow and thrive in our faith in Christ. It takes more than that. Because, secondly, Jesus gave himself to redeem and to purify. To redeem and to purify. Well, we know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Galatians 4, 4 through 5 tells us, but when the fullness of the, of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So we're familiar that God sent his one only son to redeem us, that redemption to bring salvation to us. But church, there is much more to salvation than confessing one's sin to the Lord and asking for forgiveness. When someone walks an aisle and says a sinner's prayer, it doesn't stop there, does it? That's just the beginning. Yes, we have that redemption part of it, but this tells us that Jesus gave himself to redeem and, and to purify. To purify. This is that process of sanctification. The Lord wills for each believer to be more like Him. To be more like Him. And that doesn't occur right whenever we're saved from our sin and that's it. We don't automatically become like Christ, do we? No, we still have sin in our life. We still have to go out and make decisions and choices. So the process must continue. And so what is our part in that process? It's both adding and subtracting from our life. You see, twice in this passage in Titus, we find negative or the subtraction of things and positives, the addition of things. And they're always paired up. Okay, this is the Apostle Paul emphasizing to Titus, look, it takes deleting things out of your life, but also adding things into it to help your growth, to continue your growth in Christ. In Titus 2.12, it says, God's grace trains us in both renouncing ungodliness and worldly passions. So there you have the negatives, the leading, and in living self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. There's the positives. In Titus 2.14, it says, Jesus redeems us from lawlessness, which is the negative, and into purity and good works, which is the positive. Jesus saves us from sin into godliness. You see, we need to focus on our growth in Jesus Christ. Friends, it, like I said, it's just not coming to church. It's growing it's it's getting into god's word it's being in prayer it's studying and and having that quiet time it's even journaling and and seeing your progress in your walk with him because he came to redeem and to purify us and paul is emphasizing here to Titus, one who is living in a morally corrupt culture, to stand firm on godliness, 
to stand firm on the word of God, to continue to be upright, to live sensibly. So not only do we need a focus on, okay, well, I need not do this or not do that, but we also need to add things into our lives. You know, I've talked to so many people that have said, well, I'm doing pretty good as a believer. I'm, I'm keeping all the Ten Commandments, which what do the majority of those say? Thou shalt not do this. So some of them might say, well, I've never, I don't steal, I don't kill, I don't lie, I don't commit adultery, I don't do any of these things. So I'm, I'm doing pretty good as a believer. But where are they truly at spiritually? Because if we focus completely on the don'ts, we're going to miss out on the do's. And we're not going to have that great growth in Christ that we're supposed to have. Jesus gave himself to redeem and to purify He wants us to deny the ungodliness. He wants us to deny the worldly desires. But he also wants us to live godly and to live righteously. And thirdly, Jesus' people will be zealous for good works. Will be zealous for good works. 1 Peter 3.13 tells us who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good. You know, it is very disheartening to meet Christians, to meet believers, to meet Christ followers who have no passion whatsoever for doing good works, for following Christ, for going to church, for worshiping the Lord. I'm sure you all know people like this. You've run into them. It may be a family member or a friend, but people who proclaim to be saved, proclaim to be born-again believers, yet there's just no passion whatsoever for worshiping the risen Savior. I don't know about you, but that is troublesome and is not biblical whatsoever. Because it tells us right here, we are to be zealous for good works. Zealous. So think about it. While we avoid sin with our mouths through gossip, you know, we avoid lying, we avoid unkind words. But how are we when it comes to speaking encouraging words or to voicing gratitude to others? You know, our failures can be subtle. You know, as good Christians, we understand and abide by clear rules like don't steal and don't do that. Don't commit adultery. But commands for goodness, for generosity, and service seem very subjective. You know, I I know just in, in moving here and getting used to traffic, you know, one of the first things I told Steve and, and Mike when I came into the office one morning is, I learned something very quickly. People here need to learn how to drive. <laughs> um, you know, and just in the car, I don't know if you know much about me, but I am a car guy, uh, especially American muscle. And I, I do drive an American muscle car, and I, I got a little bit of horsepower under the hood. So I have nothing to prove to other people. But boy, when someone cuts me off, or they go flying past me. You know, what's, what's our fleshly urge to do? Y'all don't look at me like you're judging me, okay? I know you all do this too, right? Right? We, we just want to, uh, right? We have to take a deep breath and realize God is teaching us patience. I don't know how often we see believers losing their witness in the driver's seat of a car. You know, I was telling the guys because I got, you know, they gave me a, a, a great welcome basket here when I got here. And there was, you know, the, the window stickers for the church, the license plate for the church. I'm like, oh, this is great advertisement as long as you drive okay. 
and you drive right, <laughs> you don't cut people off, or something much worse. But I know just getting used to the traffic here, I have really, you know, I've grown closer to the Lord in my car over the past few days, dropping my kids off to school. Uh, then I really have my quiet time because it's just led me to realize it's not only the don'ts, it's also the do's of the Christian walk. Do continue to love people. Do continue to pray for people. Someone cuts someone cut you off, don't hit the gas and ride their bumper, but rather pray for them. You don't know what's going on in their day. You don't know where they're going. You don't know what's happening in their life. So pray, stay calm, and pray for them. So we all have that area to work on, whether it's in the driver's seat of a car or talking on the phone or, or whatever area it is. Let's remember it's not always it's not all about the don'ts, it's all the it's we need to add the do's as well. You know, in in in, in being zealous for, for good works. This includes standing up and speaking out against the evils of the world. Now, I believe the church needs to have a much louder voice when it comes to prophesying and in preaching biblical principles to the world and not just sitting down and getting kicked in the gut and ran over by all the evil in the world. You know, the, the, the scriptures tell us that the spirit is not a spirit of fear or timidity, but rather of power, of love, and of sound mind. We're to stand strong and we're to stand boldly upon the word of God. So if that's standing up uh, against abortion or immorality or, or even standing up for prayer in schools, we need to be zealous for that. We need to be standing strong and standing boldly for those things. In Titus 2.1 Paul begins writing to Titus and commands him, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Listing examples like self-controlled speech and temperance too and, and reverence and, and kindness. Sound doctrine. And before instructing Titus on, on positive and negative actions, he, he gives the purpose of good works. In, in 2.10, it says, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So church, we should live lives that give God glory and turn others to him and his gospel. Never be afraid to share your testimony of what God has done in your life. You know, God has done a great work in my life over these past two weeks I know you all have been praying for us, and we felt it, and I am so excited to have been on the front lines of that and seeing God's hand at work each and every second of the past two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, actually the past two months. Ever since we came in view of a call back in early November and we began praying about this transition, God was at work, God showed up. And you all were fervently praying for us to sell our home uh, and, and for a job and for Kaya somewhere to go to school. You know, everything fell right into place. Not, not because you know, we just prayed, but also because there was faith involved. We believed it would happen. And it all came to pass. While I'm on this, I'll just share that we just got a message. We're closing on the house next week. So praise God for that. It's a week and a half sooner than they were expecting it to be. So praise God. And, uh, you know, Nikayla started her job this past Monday. Kai's in daycare. Both the boys are in school and enjoying it. So everything is right where it's supposed to be. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always stressful when you make a transition, but this one was just incredible to see God's hand at work. It was just testimony after testimony after testimony. And I, I can't wait for one of these days to be able to share every little thing that happened, just so you all know that your, your prayers are being answered, uh, almost real time in our lives. So we, we thank you for that. But, you know, beginning of the year, anybody have a New Year's resolution of losing weight? Anyone do that classic, I'm going to go on a diet? <laughs> Wow, that's great. Right. 
<laughs> you know, a lot of people do, right? At the beginning of the year, I'm not. I'm going to give up this. I'm going to give up that. I'm going to go on a diet. I want to lose this much weight before the end of the year. Uh, we 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 talk about getting in shape, being healthier, getting stronger. You know, diet and exercise. So consider those two words, because most of us have done that at one point or another, or been at the doctor at least, and the doctor told us, you need to diet and exercise. Because let's face it, one really doesn't work without the other, does it? To get the full scope of it, you've got to diet and exercise. So let me, let me put this into biblical terms. We may be good at dieting from sin, But are we good at spiritual exercise? Are we good at growing stronger in Christ through studying God's word, through prayer, listening to the Lord, through worshiping him, through really focusing on on doing good works? Because the scripture tells us that God has created good works, has already preordained good works for you to, to walk in, to do. Lord wants to train us just as a trainer trains an athlete. Friends, we're not meant to do it alone. So Paul declares that Jesus Christ is the one who purifies us from these good works or for these good works. The grace that gave us new life also trains and sustains us through the hard work of godliness. So as we think through these things and I go back to the good old cactus you may see it up here the uh, the smart aleck church member I had that sent me the second cactus that I killed um, he decided to get me one that couldn't die so I've had this one for several years you know I never have to water it it's like I don't know what that is it's not plastic not sure what it is but it's a cactus that will live forevermore it's a uh, it, it's a good cactus for someone that doesn't know how to take care of one, right? So as you think about this, remember this: there is more to it than just putting yourself in the light. There's more to just being saved. But praise be to God that we have a great instruction manual. One that we need to study. And praise be to God that we have a personal trainer called the Holy Spirit that guides us each and every day through all that we do. So let's be proactive in growing with the Lord, in study, in prayer, in discipleship, knowing and praying that God will continue to use us in a great and mighty way. May we continue to be taken away from lawless deeds and may God continue to purify for himself a people for his own possession. And church, I pray that we'll be zealous, zealous in serving our God. Each and every day we wake up, that we hit the floor, that we're praising God, that we're zealous, that we're passionate about doing good works, about helping others, about loving others. No matter who goes flying past you on the road that morning, that you're still focused and praying that God is going to do a great work. I know you're a church of prayer because we've felt it. We've experienced it already. So let's continue to be that. And let's continue to be the light, the lighthouse in our community. If you will, pray with me. Father, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word and your truth. Lord, my prayer today, God, is that we would remember what all it takes to be your child, to be your follower. Lord, we we thank you for the forgiveness that you've given us. But Lord, help us to continue to grow in you. Lord, help us to realize it's not about just being saved from our sin and living however we want to. Lord, we know that your apostle Paul wrote in Romans 6, 1, Father, that uh, should we go on sinning so that grace may abound? Lord, and we know the answer to that is no. And I pray that as God's children, 
we will not only focus on the the to the not to do's, but we will also focus on what we need to do, on how we need to be in your word, on how we need to be in prayer, and how we need to love others. God, make us strong in you. Strengthen our spirits. And Lord, may we as Rye Hill Baptist Church be the lighthouse of this community. May you continue to bless us here. And may we continue to be zealous for your work, going out, doing good works in your name. Father, we thank you for this time and we ask, God, that you continue to bless us. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.